Check. All right. I guess this thing's on. Hi, everybody. Uh, I tried to hide all the way up here in the corner, and it seems a bunch of you found me anyways, so I guess I have to give a talk. So I'm Bill Chapman, and I am a cloud architect and technical account manager at Stark & Wayne. Uh, I've been deploying, maintaining, and uh, troubleshooting platforms and services on top of OpenStack uh, for a couple of years now, uh, primarily Cloud Foundry and Bosch-related services. I came to this space by way of application development. Uh, I was an application architect looking for a better way to scale my applications. And as I said, I work for Stark and & Wayne. And Stark & Wayne is a multidisciplinary uh, operations team. We've got folks from the application space, uh, DevOps, infrastructure, and we all come together on the layer in between the infrastructure and the application uh, where our PaaS lives. Uh, Cloud Foundry and Bosch are a core component of what we do every day. And yes, as far as anyone is concerned, Batman and Iron Man are our founders. So this is OpenStack. I don't think that I need to explain OpenStack, and I would need the entire conference to do so. Uh, but the reason I put this slide in is so that we can take a second to look at OpenStack for what it is. It's a very complex distributed system. Errors can occur anywhere, and they can bubble up to places you don't expect them in other systems. And this is Cloud Foundry. Exact, this is what Cloud Foundry looks like today, along with a reference uh, resource list there. Cloud Foundry is also a very complex distributed system. And this is Bosch, which is a distributed system to distribute distributed systems. No, um, <laughs> Bosch, is, Bosch allows you to deploy distributed systems. And Cloud Foundry, of course, is deployed via Bosch. Uh, there are some situations, uh, like with Pivotal's Cloud Foundry, where Bosch is mostly abstracted away behind their operations manager, but it's still there. You still have access to it. So any discussion about troubleshooting Cloud Foundry at least on a high level, like this talk is today, is primarily going to be a discussion about troubleshooting Bosch. If Bosch is doing its job, then you should, then Cloud Foundry and um, OpenStack really shouldn't interact as much. And this is your brain on all of that. This is what cramming a whole bunch of distributed systems together looks like. And as I mentioned, I, I came to this space by way of app development. So, I went from something that looks like this, in general, to something that looks like this. And I'm starting to question my life choices. But fortunately, I found a lot of places to get help. If you get, getting involved in the Cloud Foundry community is uh, one of the first steps towards troubleshooting your environment. Uh, I spent a lot of time on the forums when I was first trying to find my way through my first Cloud Foundry deployments, especially on OpenStack, and you would be amazed how many people in the Cloud Foundry community have phenomenal experience and deep knowledge of OpenStack. We have some people in the audience today who have that knowledge. But wait, there's more. If you sign up today, I'll throw in over 80 other non-trivial services and systems that you can deploy via Bosch. A whole lot of this talk also applies to the ecosystem of Bosch releases. A quick side note, I'm going to go through a lot of examples, and some of them are no longer relevant on edge versions of Bosch, Cloud Foundry, and OpenStack. But very rarely do we encounter an organization that is on the latest version of these systems. Uh, you should note that I think Bosch is actively tested on LMNN, Liberty, Mataka, and Newton right now. Uh, but mo many of the stacks we work on are already older than that. So talking about troubleshooting this platform, on, uh, it really needs to be geared towards what's happening in the wild. Cloud Foundry and OpenStack have very aggressive release schedules for projects of their size. So I considered prun pruning this talk to only edge-related issues, but it turned out that 
I wouldn't be getting a good cross-section of what you might encounter. Next, I'm going to go through a bunch of basic problem classes that you might experience and some errors. Uh, a lot of times those errors are going to be not necessarily intuitive. That's why I'm pointing them out. And some of them may seem obvious, but I, I've got these from my notes, from the notes of colleagues, and from the notes of some of the folks I've worked with in the community. And every one of them has caused someone to go to others for help or to lose a day or two of progress. True to the talk title, we'll start out with networking. Uh, this represents the basic uh, collection of networks and subnets that you would need for just to, get just to get Bosch off the ground. In general, though, in production, obviously, you're probably going to have a much more complicated scenario. But the bottom line here is to always make sure that the networks available in your OpenStack map onto your, uh, the topology that's shown in your manifest. Uh, this is just kind of, we're just getting started, but this is a typical error you might get. And you should get used to it. You should make friends with it. You're going to spend a lot of time together. You're trying to date Cloud Foundry, but this is the annoying friend that keeps tagging along. But I say that this is related to networking, but you also uh, might run into this error if there's issues bringing up a VM. And in that case, that's not necessarily related to networking. And that's where it gets messy, because you look at this and you think, oh, that must be network related. So now we've got to talk about how do you figure out where the problem is. And that's where we learn to love our logs. And Bosch has its own logs. And sometimes you'll get distracted by them, because Bosch only knows about Bosch. The CPI is aware of the underlying infrastructure, in this case, the OpenStack CPI. But as errors flow up from OpenStack, the IaaS layer, through the CPI into Bosch, very rarely does it end up giving you the smoking gun, right? It's not always going to make sense. It's not always going to be obvious. So log tracing is going to be a skill on its own. So you need to be aware of the primary ways to get at the logs. Um, I find that I spend a lot of time in the OpenStack logs. Uh, you know, generally, ver log, OpenStack component. Uh, but over time, I've spent less and less time there. I think the community has really come together and made the CPI a lot better. Um, some of, like I said, some of these examples are going to be a little bit uh, dated for edge versions of some software. The most important thing to consider is that you need to have a good understanding of OpenStack and Bosch networking. If you have three hours before you have to go stand up Cloud Foundry, and the only thing you have time to do is read through some of the docs on OpenStack networking, you can't go wrong. It'll save you a great amount of headache later. And I have a link up here for uh, one of the troubleshooting guides that are available. Bosch debugging. This obviously is another skill you need to spend some time on. What I'm really excited about is this last example. The Bosch 2 CLI allows you to follow the logs for a particular job, which can be pretty useful. But again, this really isn't about um, the details of Bosch. It's just that before you go into a Cloud Foundry deployment, make sure you understand the Bosch CLI. Make sure you have at least a cursory knowledge of OpenStack networking. And make sure you understand what the manifest's role is in your Bosch deployment. Sometimes you'll use bespoke systems that are you're editing your manifest piecemeal. And you won't necessarily understand that the manifest is everything that makes your deployment your deployment. If there is something wrong in your deployment and it's not OpenStack, it's probably something in your manifest. And if you go to the community I mentioned before for help, the first thing they're going to do is ask you, can you show me what your manifest looks like? You'll see some examples later where uh, this comes into play. I threw this in here because it's a 
diagram we like to use when people come to ask for help. Uh, try to classify which ver vertice, ver vertex <laughs> the uh, problem lies in on this triangle because you've got OpenStack that has to speak to your vir virtual machines. You've got Bosch, the director, that has to speak to your virtual machines. And you've got Bosch that needs to speak to OpenStack. And the problem can lie on any one of these vertex. And what's interesting is Bosch has its own view of the world. OpenStack has its own view of the world. And it's really helpful to understand that. Because sometimes some of the errors we're going to go through is just a matter of Bosch's view of the world not syncing with OpenStack's view of the world. So you go to look at your manifest, and your manifest says, oh, this is right. And then you go to look at OpenStack, and OpenStack seems to imply something's right, but it turns out that there's an error somewhere else where it thinks a VM was down and it can't release a port. And it, it, it gets pretty interesting. So if you're coming to the community for help, uh, spend some time trying to figure out if the problem is between OpenStack and the VMs, Bosch and the VMs, or OpenStack and the Bosch director. And hopefully some of these examples will help. Now let's get to what are probably way too many examples in too little time. I'll try to get them through them quickly. I know we probably want to go to lunch, right? So you will probably face some of these issues. We'll start out with key pairs. Bosch must be provided with a key pair that you can use to communicate with instances. Uh, without a valid key, your deployments will fail. This is a pretty nice class of error because it usually is spelled right out for you. It'll say missing private key. But sometimes it's not. In this case, if you're using OpenStack, OpenStack Liberty, or Mataka, you can't use their SSH key generator. You have to generate one manually. So even if you tell the, the API to, to generate that for you, it doesn't matter. It will not. Um, can, actually, can you use the API to generate a key? I haven't. Yes, you can. Of course you can. <laughs> it will break. It will not work. But you'll look in OpenStack, and OpenStack will say, hey, yes, this, this is here. It worked. And then you'll go to try to run Bosch Deploy, and it'll fail. This is a case of uh, a bug that's actually in Liberty and Mataka. So it doesn't fall into the base um, class of error, and a lot of validation uh, might not even catch this. Another thing to keep in mind is VM communication. Bosch requires that the virtual machines have to be able to communicate with one another. I think we've seen this error before. This one's going to come out a lot. I told you it's that annoying friend that wants to tag along on your dates. It's not going to go away. This one here is a typical error you might get if uh, you have blocked network connectivity between the agent and the Bosch director. But then again, it's also typical for a whole other class of problems. And we're going to see a pattern here. And that pattern is that. The, Bosch, well, the error that Bosch spits out is going to point to an entire class of problems. And sometimes that might mean you have to go look in the Nova logs. And sometimes it might mean you have to go look in the Neutron logs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how to mitigate that later. Security group rules. Uh, the Bosch security group is the security group that, Bosch's, that Bosch VMs will be deployed within. And this right here is the reference list of security group rules. Uh, it's the minimum set that you need uh, to make Bosch do its thing. It's not necessarily production. You wouldn't use this in production. And it's definitely not the most secure. But what I've seen happen far too many times, you have problems with security groups, and then you do this. I've seen this happen a lot, especially when you're fighting with third-party SDNs. You know, many a young adventurer has lost a battle with Neutron. I've done this myself. This is actually from a uh, OpenStack that's running on my home lab. It's a short fix, but you'll feel dirty about it in the morning. Don't do it. Seriously. Oh, no, not again. This error is going to pop up again. Uh, Security group rules. Default flavors. So this one's interesting. Again, some type of validation will probably check to make sure you have all your default flavors. But a lot of people don't put a lot of thought into it because when you go to, Gesundheit, sir. When you go to 
the documentation from Pivotal or from us at Stark and Wayne, it'll give you this list. And it'll say, put these in, make sure OpenStack has these available. But you really need to make some consideration about uh, what your use case is for Cloud Foundry. Often these flavors will not be sufficient for what you're trying to do. When I mentioned this to my colleagues, the responses ranged from, really? You have problems with flavors? To, yeah, yeah, that bit me. So, you know, when it's a problem, it's really a problem. Uh, it really depends what you're going to do with it. And I, this, this is a, a fun example for me because I was looking for uh, an example from the past. I remembered having issues with flavors, so it made it into the talk. And I'm trying to find an error for the slide, and I, I couldn't make it, I couldn't get the failure that I had remembered. So I went looking and I found this, and I thought, this is great, somebody else had the same problem I did. And five minutes into reading through the slide, I said, no, I had that problem, this is me. It happens way too often. This error happened because the manifest had a vSphere specific directive in it, and it was just skipping all of the OpenStack stuff. Quota issues are also common, especially the first time you deploy things, and especially if you have a large production deployment and your organization uh, or your, your tenant doesn't have the, the resources it needs. Uh, big thing here is to consider Diego, which is, is probably by far going to be your uh, largest consumer of resources, because that's where your applications run. And when you think about your quotas, you're going to come back to your a minimum deployment. And I, I use PCF, uh, because this is uh, what Pivotal documents as the minimum amount of resources that you need to run a PCF deployment. So it should become pretty clear that quotas are a big deal. And then you end up doing this, <laughs> which, which, which is probably also a bad idea. But if you happen to have admin rights to your tenant, uh, you might be tempted. Uh, you probably shouldn't. Another error that falls into the quota class. Uh, in this case, Bosch was trying to provision a new VM and they didn't have the quota for it, you get VM creation failed. This is the second class of error, the timeout pinging one we've seen three times already. VM creation fail you are also going to see all the time. And again, the pattern here should be that you, you shouldn't get too caught up in the error. Uh, you need to dig deeper because the errors aren't necessarily going to uh, explain the problem to you. OpenStack APIs, this one is another one to, uh, to think about. In this case, uh, you need to know that Bosch needs to be able to talk to compute, it needs to be able to talk to identity, it needs to be, talk to be able to talk to image storage, and optionally, it needs to be talked to networking. Here's an issue you get if your API is unavailable. But what's interesting about this is this error happened because there was an upgrade to a newer version of the OpenStack CPI. Everything worked fine on version 27, and on version 28, OpenStack networking became the default. And all of a sudden, we're in a situation where this client wasn't using OpenStack networking. So this problem arose, and it, was, it, did, it worked fine yesterday, which ends up being difficult. Stem cell issues. Sometimes you have a problem with stem cells, and usually it's pretty straightforward because it'll, Bosch will just yell at you. You didn't have, you know, missing stem cell. But sometimes you get a problem that the stem cell's missing, but Bosch will think that the stem cell's there. So you try to upload the image and you can't. This usually means that somebody deleted the stem cell on you in your OpenStack. Again, all of these examples are examples in the real world from notes. That's it's just a cross-section that I believe most folks will encounter. Image provisioning. You need to be aware how OpenStack applies things like your SSH keys to your stem cells when they come up, right? Well, the stem cell uses the metadata service. So you can check to make sure that an image can hit the metadata service by doing something like this, 
And in this case, that's the output you should receive. If you don't, then there's a problem. And then we get this error again. Four times, four dates, four best friends tagging along. In this case, if you're having problems with the metadata service, you're not going to be able to SSH into any of your VMs. You're also going to have issues. Bosch is going to bring the VM up just fine, but then it's not going to be able to communicate with it necessarily. Um, so also remember that uh, Bosch stores stem cells in Glance or in image service in general. So uh, you're going to want to check the amount of disk space you have available, things like that. Rate limiting. This one's also fun <laughs> because Bosch throws hundreds of calls against your OpenStack API. And if Nova has rate limiting set too low, you're going to get an error like this, which is actually not very intuitive <laughs> because that doesn't say uh, anything about I'm making too many requests. I think in newer versions of the CPI, this may be cleaned up, but uh, this was the error we were getting at the time. So if stem cells are actually just machine images, we need to uh, check the amount of disk space that's being used for Glance. If you're having trouble uploading stem cells, uh, make sure you haven't run out of space. Uh, I've moved on now. I've got a bunch of uh, just some housekeeping things that we'll go through. VM performance. I've found that, actually we've found, that sometimes you'll have problems with the performance of large distributed systems on top of OpenStack, and you have to take care to figure out what uh, type of emulation mode you're using. Uh, in this case, usually set setting your CPU, CPU mode to host pass-through will actually alleviate the problem, but it's really not something you should do without understanding what's going on under the hood. It's probably a decision for your admin team to make, but this is something you can point them at if you're having issues. Also, I like to be aware of the default CPU allocation ratio and the overcommit ratio for memory, because uh, you, sometimes you want to double check those things if you're having uh, performance issues, because if you didn't stand up the stack, you don't necessarily know what's going on under the hood. Chances are you're not going to have that access, but you could at least say, hey, I'd like you to check this for me and let me know what's going on. Network performance is another interesting class of problem. Uh, Jan mentioned MTU issues earlier. There, there's, uh, you, can, you can make changes to your manifest. You can update MTU settings in, in uh, Nova. There's a bit of a dark art to that. But another networking performance issue that isn't always apparent is that Neutron itself can be a bottleneck. Um, there's ways to get around this. Uh, distributed virtual routing, for example, where uh, the, 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 le the level three agent is distributed across the compute nodes. Right. Um, but the first time this had come up, I, I actually hadn't expected it. Um, you, can, you can distribute your, uh, you can add more neutron nodes, or you can use a third party SDN provider as well to try to get around this. But when you consider that a typical large enterprise production cloud foundry might have hundreds of, well, say 110 Diego cells, you know, you want to make sure that you're scaling that traffic. Proxy issues also, um, they're not necessarily OpenStack specific, but the reason they're here is because I find that a lot of the clients we've dealt with that are using OpenStack are also using some type of internal OpenStack, right? They, there's, it's more likely that an OpenStack is going to be behind a uh, corporate firewall. And you're going to come run into some pretty interesting issues with this uh, because some of the build packs, interestingly, this is the first issue that is Cloud Foundry specific. Everything else has been about Bosch. Uh, but some of the build packs actually need to go grab stuff from GitHub. So sometimes you have to actually specify the proxy in your, excuse me, in your application manifest. There's also some problems with the UAA where 
the UAA controller will not recognize uh, the proxy flag. And if you have another flag, so there's the HTTP proxy flag and then proxy, and the no proxy flag, I think. Well, there's two flags and they don't, the hierarchy of them isn't set right. So you might have one flag set and think everything should work and then uh, you can't get any access to the outside world. So you need to be aware of proxy issues. Cinder, I don't actually have anything about Cinder right now, but Cinder, if you're not aware of it, is the OpenStack dating app. It allows you to swipe left for reliable block storage. Come on, really? <laughs> actually, no, I do have an example for Cinder. Um, sometimes a Bosch deployment will break because a host, a compute host goes down. Uh, Bosch will try to resurrect that VM, the VMs will become unresponsive, and, but the, because the, the VM relied on a host or that's no longer available because the compute node went down. Uh, so this means that the VMs attached, uh, this could mean that the VMs were attached to cinder volume, uh, the, the cinder volumes uh, aren't resurrecting properly uh, because it is stuck in the attached state to a VM that no longer exists. So this is a, we've come full circle, we're back to my first Cloud Foundry. So we went backwards in time just now. Newer errors to f errors in the beginning. And this one is relevant because it was one of my first battles with Bosch on OpenStack. And as you'll see, we've seen this error twice already. And this error, in this case, I had assumed that OpenStack must be working correctly because this was one of my first experience with, with OpenStack and it's this huge project, it's got all this support, I met all these great people I'm thinking, okay, so OpenStack's working, it's, this must be a problem with Bosch. So after a day or so of troubleshooting, I finally found my way to the Nova logs and it turned out that there was a bug in Nova that was not allowing IP addresses to be manually assigned to new instances as they were brought up. So I figured this out, I patched it, then I did some Googling and I found that there was an actually, actually an open issue for it. And it's interesting because we've now seen three or four errors that all have the same error in Bosch, three or four situations that have all have the same uh, VM create failed, uh, a bunch that have the same uh, unable to ping, and uh, the point of all of that was, it was, when I was looking through my notes, it was pretty fascinating that I didn't expect to keep seeing the same errors over and over again. And the, it really is all about needing to go dig deeper. This is my last example. And I can thank uh, Sean Carey at Pivotal for this one. So in this case, uh, the Bosch deploys were failing. Instances were getting created, but the director couldn't talk to the agent. And it turned out that there was, uh, Neutron was timing out, trying to create, uh, trying to release the IP address from an orphaned instance. And it was taking, uh, it was disallowing those agents from uh, having an IP address assigned. And what I like about this one is, is it's, it's really indicative of the general case of problems that we see in the wild, so to speak. And it's that there's no way to prep for this one <laughs> except really understanding OpenStack networking, which was my point from the beginning. Uh, all of these examples that preceded it all seem to fall into nice, neat classes, but then I show you an error message that doesn't fall into the class that it might be. And then this is another one that kind of hits that point forward. And the reason I wanted to share this is because this was a really painful one for them. Uh, they had a lot of uh, people who know their way around working on it, and it took a couple days to figure out, and it turned out to be something fairly silly. So tools for the uh, discerning operator. There's, there's a lot of Uh, available packages out there that can help here. Uh, 
And I find that any list of them would probably take a whole other talk to say. But these are ones that we use a lot at Stark and Wayne, or at least I use for some of the things I do. Uh, libvert, you should get to know libvert. Libvert, of course, is, uh, takes a lot of the pain about uh, out of troubleshooting uh, virtual host-based issues. Uh, for example, we've had instance migrations fail uh, in OpenStack when we're trying to move things around. And you can use uh, Versh to get an idea of what the hypervisor thinks the world looks like. And you can see what Bosch thinks the world looks like. CF sizing tool. This one is surprisingly useful. You can pick your, your IaaS. You can say what size deployment you want, you, and it will s spit out, this is what you need. These are the flavors you need. This is, the, uh, this is how your flavors should be sized. Uh, if you even use the AWS one, it will tell you how much it will cost. And this is nice because if you do this before you go down the path of deploying Cloud Foundry, you can at least get an idea of how you're going to size those quotas, how you're going to size uh, the flavors that you're going to use, what kind of quotas you need to give to. Um, I just said quotas twice. We'll skip that. OK. So <laughs> Codex. This one's interesting. And uh, my colleague, Xu Zhao, is actually going to speak a little bit about this later. Codex is a, a workbook that Stark and Wayne has been putting together. And it is uh, all of our best practices for deploying on uh, the IS lay layers that we have worked with our clients. And it's a living document. So as we come up with new techniques for things, we, uh, we add it in here so that anybody that wants to see how we're doing things can come here. Often our clients will approach us and say, we want you to do what Codex says. Um, it is a little different uh, than uh, other companies, I think, because this is the way we do it. But uh, it has become our internal best practices. And then Jen talked about this at length. Um, there's a CF validation tool uh, that the community supports that actually will cover a whole lot of the errors we've seen today. It, at least they'll cover the error classes. I tried to throw in errors that might not necessarily get caught by the validation tool. At the very least, it won't catch them all if you're not running the validation in pipeline regularly. For example, it can tell you if uh, the security groups can be created. It can tell you if they exist right now. But if you're not running your validation regularly, you don't know what the state of the world is or if it's still valid tomorrow. This should go without saying, but script all your automation. Terraform is one way. Our codex documentation uses Terraform, and we already have Terraform uh, scripting that will stand up our uh, reference OpenStack. The first time I, I the first time I set up OpenStack, uh, it was uh, a, a hundred or so lines of Python, and that actually is really friendly too. I mean, being that it integrates so well with with the OpenStack API. Bosch UI is another helpful tool, and Bosch UI is a relatively new project that Stark and Wayne has added to the Cloud Foundry community, and it gives you a nice view of your Bosch world. It lets you, uh, you can SSH into your Bosch. You can see logs. Um, we're going to update it for Bosch 2 so that it has some of the features that Bosch 2's uh, CPI, or sorry, CLI will support. And finally, if this isn't readily apparent, ship your logs. If you've got 30 compute nodes, and every one of them has its own copy of, its, of what's going on in its view of Nova. I mean, some distributions, actually, I hope most distributions now actually do some type of forwarding to a controller node. But if you're standing up your own bespoke OpenStack, I've, I've come into situations often where there's nothing happening with the logs out of the gate. This should be the first thing you do. It should be pretty clear from what I've talked about today that you need access to those OpenStack logs. Most of the errors we've talked about, you, I showed you what Bosch has, has said. This is the problem. Uh, and I did have lots of slides that also said this is what OpenStack says. And it turned out I just didn't have the time to really discuss all of them. So I thought it would be easier to make the point that um, you really have to dig a little deeper. And that's why we get to this point. 
Uh, this here is a project from Stark and Wayne called Sawmill. And Sawmill is pretty uh, useful because it's basically tail-f for distributed systems. So you can't really, you're not getting any log retention, but you can see exactly what's going on right now, make the error happen, and, and get it in front of your face. Uh, a few people uh, contributed to my talk, and some of their examples are in here, and I wanted to thank them. Uh, James Hunt, Jeremy Budneck, Sean Carey, Craig Buchek, and then my wife for putting up with me in general. And uh, that's all I have today. There's a couple of minutes, but it is also lunchtime. So, <laughs> so if anybody had any questions, other. Uh, all right. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yep. Jan can answer that one. The, the, what, what OpenStack versions does the validator support? Ah, OK, yes, I actually mentioned that. That's right. <laughs> yep. Cool. Excellent. All right, enjoy lunch, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>